Good morning and welcome to this Archer 2 single node optimization course. Um, my name is Adrian Jackson. I'll set my camera on just now so you can uh, see me, but I won't leave it on. And mainly because I find it too distracting for myself. But uh, I just wanted to say hi before we got going. Uh, just to let you know that these whole session will be being recorded uh, so that people who couldn't attend um, can have uh, a look at it later. Uh, if you've got any problems with that, let me know. Um, other than that, we shall get started. All our training material is, is available online, and I'll, I'll tell you where if you've not seen the links uh, shortly. I, I think Rui has also shared some of the links in the, in the chat for this Collaborate session as well, uh, which is good. And all our training material can be reused um, if you want to for your own purposes, as long as you uh, apply the appropriate license and share the appropriate credit. Um, Archer 2 is a UKRI service, which is uh, run by a, a group of people, uh, including ourselves at Edinburgh and Cray, who uh, run this, who provide the hardware and uh, support the hardware as well. Uh, and so in, in case you're not aware of it, Archer 2 is a, the national service for high performance computing for EPSRC primarily uh, as part of the UK Research Councils. Uh, and it's something that we run in Edinburgh. So it sits in our machine room and we'll see some pictures in a minute outside, outside of Edinburgh. Um, it's a Cray HPE system, uh, but as part of it, part of the funding for the, the supercomputer, there's also this funding to enable support and help support and help people use the system. So it's what we call CSE support, computational science and engineering. And as a part of that, there is training associated with it, which of course you know about because you're on this course. But this is where the funding for this course comes from. Uh, we teach a number of different courses from introductory, so, uh, uh, level things like the software carpentry is all the way through to quite involved quite in depth you know, how do you do advanced mpi programming or open mp programming and this course here sits somewhere in the middle it's a it's a introduction to the node hardware with some more advanced details in it uh, to allow you to start getting up and running with with the system and uh, improving the performance of code on the system hopefully uh, this is Archer 2. Doesn't look hugely impressive, but actually it's, it's a relatively big system. So it's about 6,000 compute nodes, so 6,000 servers. Um, each uh, node has 128 cores in it. So that gives us about three quarters of a million CPU cores. Um, and each node has 256 gigabytes of memory. Although there are some larger memory nodes for people who need higher amounts of memory per, per compute core. And they go up to 512 gigabytes per node. One of the special features of a, of a high performance computer like Archer 2 is the network. So we need a high bandwidth and a low latency network to enable us to send messages between different nodes quickly and efficiently. And in this scenario, we use Cray's what we call slingshot uh, interconnect. So this is a network uh, designed and built by Cray for, for high performance and uh, uh, high reliability when it works. Uh, we've had some issues with it over, since we've got Archer 2, but uh, that's that's one of the differentiators between a system like Archer 2 and, and something that you would maybe build yourself is that a lot of money goes into the network to enable us to run large scale parallel jobs which use more than one node at once without having too many overheads in doing that. Of course, this course is really about single node performance, so we're not going to focus on the network, but um, that is there and, and used heavily by, by the, the applications that are run on the system. Uh, and then no system would be uh, functional without somewhere to store data, so we have a bunch of, of file systems uh, a particular interest here was for parallel file systems, uh, which which use Lustre, and that's where we store most of our data, 
for the high performance part of Arch 2. And then there's also something called a burst buffer file system. So again, we won't particularly cover it this in, the, in this course, but if you have applications that are very IO intensive, have to do lots of reading and writing of data, and that's a bottleneck for you, uh, then the optimizing your use of the Lustre file systems or considering to use this burst buffer file system, which is a, um, a faster file system in some circumstances, may be one of the ways you can go in, in optimizing your application. Um, if that is something that's of interest to you, as, as I say, we, we don't cover that or the network, particularly in this course, but, but do let me know um, and I can look at more material or point you in the right direction of, of things that may be of interest to you there. Um, so EPCC, uh, the department that I work for, runs um, Archer 2, runs and operates Archer 2. We're a part of the University of Edinburgh. Uh, and we've been doing parallel computing for quite a long time. So that's what we do a lot of is, is running and, and supporting high performance computing for academics and, and industry. Um, and actually we came out of um, physics in Edinburgh because physics in Edinburgh in the eighties had a large number of, of big parallel computers for their research. And, and so that's why that's why we were born. Uh, we do also do a fair bit of teaching. So we have a master's in, in high performance computing and a master's in high performance computing and data science. We have PhD students and we do research as well. So if you are interested in collaborating, we exist. They come and find us. As I've already mentioned, we do a, a, a wide range of training courses, which I assume you're aware of because you're on this one. Uh, but if you want to have a look at the other kind of courses that we do and we're running soon or in the future, then uh, have a look at the Archer 2 training uh, website. Um, and the nice thing is that all the courses we've, we've ever run are still online. So the, the, the slides and the exercises will still be online and the recordings generally will be on, online as well. We also run a set of virtual tutorials, uh, which happen uh, every couple of weeks where somebody gives a presentation on a topic for an hour or so uh, and they can be really interesting so quite often those are from arch2 users or people who are, are are doing work on optimizing things on the system or, or, or those kind of things uh, so they can be worth uh, going along and having a look at so they're on the training online website and then if you have any problems or questions about Arch2, one of the places you can go is the documentation. So there's quite a nice comprehensive set of documentation on the system, the software that's on the system and how you use it. Um, so that's a good port of call to start with. I should introduce myself. As I said, I'm Adrian Jackson. This is my email here. So if you want to uh, ask any questions during this course, then you're more than welcome to do it in the Collaborate chat. Uh, but if you'd rather do it privately, then you can send me an email as well. Um, I'm a researcher here at EPCC, so I spend a lot of my time doing, trying to make applications run faster on bits of computing hardware or thinking about how we make new bits of computing hardware to make applications um, run faster. And I do a fair bit of teaching as well. So teach uh, like uh, Mark, my colleague, who, who may be around today, who's going to teach most of tomorrow, Mark Bull, uh, very similarly teaches a lot of uh, MSc and, and does research into high performance computing. Um, and we also have a, another colleague, Rui, here, who's here today, um, who is uh, works on the Archer 2 service as well. So he can help out with any issues that we have. Now I should say that uh, it's early, in the course yet, but there will be a, tr a feedback form um, for you to provide feedback on the course um, and the service in general. Uh, I have this link here. You'll get an email um, about this after the course finishes to remind you. It can be very useful for us to, to, to work out whether a course was useful, are, are there any things that were good, are there any things that were bad, um, are there things that you'd like to see in the future. It's pretty basic 
feedback from uh, actually the, the main thing we need is the top bit which says was this a good or bad course and then you can provide more details if you want uh, but I would encourage you and I will try and remember to tell you to remind you about this but would encourage you to to fill that out if you can because it is useful for us to know um, what went well and what didn't there is a whole support service that goes with Archer 2 so uh, what we call a help desk um, or I think they actually call it a service desk now, so I should have changed that, but uh, that's what it is, um, um, a, a query system. Uh, so if you have any general questions or queries about Archer 2 after the course, then feel free to drop an email to support at archer2.ac.uk. Okay, so this is a course where we do some lectures, um, but Fortunately, you don't have to listen to me talking all the time, but there are sessions where you can do some hands-on practical uh, work where you get onto the system and you try uh, running some exercises that we've already written. To do this, we've, we've set up a project on Arch2 which you can have an account in. It's this TA129 project, and that gives you an account on the system and some time to run so that a budget with some time to run on it. Generally, we, we keep these, these projects open for a while after the course has run, so usually up for a month after the course is finished. Um, and that lets you play around with the system for a little bit afterwards and, and come back and, and do some of the exercises and those kind of things. If you already have an Archer 2 account, then you don't need to use this TA129. You can use your existing Archer 2 account. For some of our training, we set up reservations on the system to make it easier to run jobs. But for this um, course, because we're already doing single node jobs, we can just use the short queue on Archer 2. We don't need reservations. If we needed reservations, then the, using a project account in, in this special training project, TA129, would have been useful because it gives you access to those reservations. And reservations are just a part of a machine that's been set aside for your particular jobs so you can run them quickly uh, you don't have to wait in the, in the usual queue but we're fortunate that the short queue in Archer 2 is is a special set of resources set aside for people running jobs in and it's pretty quick as well so we don't generally use reservations for this course we just say running the short queue your jobs will run pretty quickly and um, and we can get on with the exercises that way so if you already have a, an account on Archer 2 and you've got uh, some budget in that and you're happy to use the budget in that for this course, it won't use large amounts of your budget, uh, but it will use some of it, then you don't need to set up a, an, an account on this project TA129. If you don't have an Archer 2 account or you don't want to use your other accounts for this training course, which is perfectly fine, then what you need to do for the practical sessions after the first set of lectures is set up a, an account on the system using this project here. Now, you should have had an email from Claire, from the training at Arch2 team, telling you, or, or from the SAFE maybe actually, because we're doing it slightly differently now, uh, telling you how to do this. If you've not had that email and you want to set up an account, or you've had that email but you've not set up an account because you don't know what to do, now is a good time to let us know. So drop in the chat or, or send me an email or, or open up your mic and speak to us. And let us know and we can sort out your accounts on the system. If you've not had the, if you've not set up the account, but you've got the email, now would be a good time to, to click through and, and see if that works for you. It should be pretty straightforward. Um, if you use this project account, um, then, as I say, it should be open for about a month after the course finishes. And then after that, two weeks after that, so six weeks after the course finish, we tend to close and delete the accounts. All that means is if there's anything you want to keep from this course, then you should copy it off at some point. And if you don't know how to do that, then let us know and we can give you a hand copying your files and your data off the system. Having said all that, the slides and the uh, exercises are all online and won't be going away. So if it's just a question of you want to find them later and redo them, and then they should all be on there in the system. 
Has anybody got any questions about access to Archer 2 before we keep going? Okay. Um, all our training courses are run under a code of conduct, which basically means um, don't be an idiot, particularly don't be an idiot to other people. Uh, but uh, if you uh, want the details of it, there is a training code of conduct web page. We've also with a an incident reporting form for for you, for you if you want to report something that's happened which is violates this code of conduct. So that's all online on the website, and I would uh, I would encourage you to go and have a look at it. Something which is um, you know uh, not to do with this training, but it's also associated with Archer 2. Uh, one of the other things that comes along with the service is uh, is funding. And so there's something called ECSE, Embedded CSE Support, um, which allows people to apply for money or people to do work on their codes. And that's because the research councils recognize that it's, you know, challenging requires um, certain skills and, and certain amount of effort to get an application running efficiently on a system like Archer 2. But if you can get applications running efficiently, that's beneficial for everybody because that uses less compute time and it saves more compute time for other people. So what we want to be able to do is use this hardware as efficiently as possible, and which is why we teach this course. Um, but Doing that for a large code can be expensive, can be time consuming. So there are a set of uh, regular funding calls which um, you can apply to to say, I want you to give me some money to employ somebody at my institution to uh, speed up my code or, or do a number of things. So the funding will let you do algorithmic improvements, scalability, sustainability and maintainability and performance and also porting codes um, from uh, smaller computers to Archer 2 as well. And, and actually, this has been expanded recently um, to allow you to, to also do work on codes which involves hardware, which Archer 2 doesn't have. So there's a, there's been a, fo a new focus from uh, the research councils on GPU computing, because we know future high performance computers will be heavily dominated by uh, GPUs, or some of them will be. Um, so you can also now apply to say, I want to port this code to GPUs, uh, even though Archer 2 doesn't have any. Um, so the nice thing about this is you can ask for money locally, uh, as long as you can sort of demonstrate that you've got a, a sensible plan for employing somebody who could do his work. Or you can ask for somebody from EPCC to, to help you on your software as well. So you can apply either of those kind of things. And, and generally, it's one person for up to 18 months. To, to do work on a code. Um, so there's a web page for this as well. So it's the Archer 2 website ECSE, uh, and that can give you details on on how to do that. We've just been through a round, I think. Um, so I think the next round opens uh, early next year. Any questions about those, just let me know. Otherwise, we'll continue on to the course. Okay, so today um, I'll be teaching you and we've got a set of lectures um, on the hardware and then some of the things we need to do to optimize code on the system. So profiling of codes, optimizing using the compiler um, and, and those kind of things. And so I'll be teaching that today. And as you can see, we have these practical sessions throughout. So we've got lectures up till half 10 today, then a practical session, and then a break, and then uh, a lecture on profiling and finding performance hotspots, and then a, a practical on profiling, so doing that yourself, and then we have lunch one till two, and then we have a set of lectures and practicals in the, in the afternoon. Now you can see from 3.30 onwards today is pretty much practicals, and um, so that's a, a, a chance for you to to go away and work on the profile and optimization approach. Um, but we'll, I'll be around until half past five here 
um, and we can uh, chat about it if you want to go off and do it in your own time that's also perfectly fine i tend to do a summary of the uh, of the day at about five o'clock for 10 minutes um, and then and then you can go off and do your own thing tomorrow as i said uh, my colleague mark bull uh, will be taking over uh, and looking a bit more at some of the things you can do to optimize the code. So OpenMP optimization, so this is single node, but parallel. Um, and then some of the other things you may care about, vectorization and memory hierarchy optimizations uh, with some practical stuff to that. And a slightly earlier finish tomorrow, which is always nice for a Friday. So a half four instead of half, half five. But again, finishing on practicals uh, if, you want, if you need to get away earlier. All the stuff that we're teaching today is on GitHub. Um, so I think uh, Rory's, uh, Rory's already put this into the, the chat for this um, course, and uh, the link to this. But yes, uh, there's a GitHub uh, repository for this course, the single node optimization course. And then we have branches for each time we run it. So today we're on the 2023-11-23 branch. Um, so you can go and find all the slides there and the exercise material. Uh, you don't necessarily need to go off and, and download all, all that or anything like that. I'll let you know more details, but that's where it is. Um, these are more pictures of Archer 2, so you can now see see the, the lovely system sitting in, uh, in the room. A uh, picture on the left-hand side actually is the network. So those are the optical networks uh, connecting together the connecting together the different rows of computers. Uh, and the picture on the right hand side is all the liquid cooling uh, pipes that go into these um, individual computer nodes because uh, they're pretty hot. Uh, these computers are quite densely packed together. Um, and so the, the only way you can do that is, is by using liquid cooling directly onto the processors through metal plates. Um, and so they, they have these hot and cold loops, which the red and blue pipes are, to allow us to to pack all this computer into a smaller space. If, if you didn't do this, if you had to do it air cooled, you'd, you'd need a much bigger room to fit the computer into. So that's what that, that is there. OK. Um, as I said, we're going to do a set of exercises. So we provide you with source code to run the different exercises. Um, you can take that from the repository that we've given you using Git and, 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 and cloning that out. Um, but actually also I put it into a, a particular place you should be able to access on the system. So this slash work slash Z19 slash shared slash SNO single node optimization dot tar. If you run this command on Archer 2, you can copy the, all the exercises we have and then unpack them for us to use later. Now, you don't have to do this now because we've got another lecture to come before we get on to practicals, but this is what we'll be doing at half past 10 or there and thereabouts, depending on how long I overrun on the lectures. Uh, so hopefully this course will be useful and enjoyable for you. Um, if not, then do provide us feedback. That's always useful as well. Um, but above all else, please do ask questions if there's things that are not clear or things that don't make sense or things that you uh, are more interested in. So these courses, particularly when we're giving them remotely like this, can be hard to, to get into if you're uh, sitting at the other end of a computer. But the best way around that is for you to jump in and ask questions where things don't make sense or where things need more explanation. Um, or if you've got particular questions that are associated with your particular application or your particular use of the system, then feel free to ask them. Uh, as I say, we can do that just by unmuting and, and, and using your microphone or putting a, a message in the chat. You can also do private messages in the chat so you don't have to uh, speak to everybody. Um, and you can drop me an email as well. Uh, so do, do, do please uh, use any of those methods um, to ask your questions because it, it really does help improve the course if you if you get engaged with it. 
Any questions before we move on to the next lecture? And as you'll see, I'm already uh, running over my time anyway. So this was meant to start 15 minutes ago. <laughs> so we'll see how he gets on in terms of, of staying on target for the time. But we have plenty of time built into the practical slots. So don't worry too much if we if we run slightly over time on the lectures. Um, anyway, OK, so we're looking at the node architecture here for Arch2 because it's a single node optimization course. Um, so we're looking to see what does that node look like? Um, what does a compute node look like in general? And what, where can you have some impact on your performance? OK. And so if we take this down to a, a, a most basic level, uh, there are sort of four things we may care about. And of course, there's, there's a lot more detail in here, but there's about four things we may care about for a, node, a system like Archer 2 that can impact our performance. So processes, which are things which take, take uh, data and convert it or generate data for us, and uh, memory, which is where we store our data whilst we're working on it. A network or interconnect, which is the way we um, uh, communicate with other workers in the system. And storage, which is where we st store data long term. Uh, and we've already seen on Archer 2 that we have a fast network called the Create Slingshot uh, network for the interconnect. And we have some fast parallel file systems a luster and a burst buffer for storage. Um, as I said earlier on, we're not really going to focus on these last two, the storage of a network, uh, because this is this is all about what's inside a single node. But if you have questions about those, uh, we can take them offline. Um, so what we're going to look at is how we can use processes and memory efficiently. And as I say, there's a lot of detail in there. So processes involve and include memory as well. So they have caches inside them and, and we'll come on to look at all of that kind of stuff. But those are the bits of hardware we're going to be looking at um, and looking at how we can structure programs to efficiently utilize those bits of hardware. Um, obviously, there's a thing that's missing from this list, which would be accelerators. So if you are on another system with GPUs, they would also be an important feature for performance uh, that you would need to consider. At some level, those accelerators like GPUs are simply a form of processor, but they are, uh, tend to be slightly separate and, and uh, have their own um, features that need considered for optimization and, and performance improvement. So generally considered separately, but at the moment, Arch2 doesn't have GPUs, so we, we're not looking at those either. OK. So what is a processor? I mean, this is the thing which takes your data and runs instructions to operate on that data. So it loads data from memory and stores data to memory. It executes instructions and it decides what instructions to execute next. What we're generally using this for is, is, is uh, maths, so uh, arithmetic performed on values in registers. Uh, registers are local storage on the processes themselves. So they are where the data is kept when it's being worked on directly on the processor. Um, moving data between the processor uh, to the registers and memory is done explicitly. So this is done by what we call load store instructions. And so that's part of the work that gets done, just moving data in and out of the processor so that it can be worked on. Now, of course, there are things you can do where you don't have to move any data, where you just generate data, but it's still, there'll be some point where you have to take the data you've generated and take it away from the processor so it can do work on other things. And that's because uh, this short-term, high-performance temporary data storage on the processors that we call registers is limited in size. So typically, um, a processor will have you know, tens up to 100 registers. And this is where it stores the data that's been at, worked on at this point in time. Uh, we generally have separate registers for integer and floating point values. So integers and, and, and numbers with, with uh, decimals after the floating point. 
uh, and that's because they're stored in slightly different ways and so they need a different hardware to support them but you can see you know if you can only store up to 100 values then most programs are going to be spending some time having to change what values are in registers uh, so they can work on different things um, and that means we have to move things we have to store things back to memory and load things from memory we want to work on a different piece of data or a different piece of the program um, if we look at processes and then we can consider that they have a sort of set of basic functionality which can determine their performance uh, one is clock speed um, and so this is my processor runs at one gigahertz or two gigahertz or i think in archer 2k is 2.2 gigahertz um, and that is the number of instructions it can do per second the number of instructions it can run per second um, and then there's also for the kind of work we tend to do on systems like archer 2 there's also a idea of peak floating point capability so you can run um, however many clock speed floating point operations per second uh, but then inside that there tends to be some more complexity on how the floating point operations work particularly because there are in modern cpus vector units which let you run more than one floating point operation at once and some of those floating point operations can be quite complicated so we can do things like a, a multiply and an add in a single instruction so we generally tend to characterize our processors by their clock speed and by their peak floating point capability. We, we focus on floating point here because that tends to be the kind of uh, arithmetic that we, we that dominates the performance of computational simulation applications um, and to some degree machine learning as well. Uh, but uh, you can have applications where they're much more limited by integer arithmetic uh, because the integer and the floating point tends to be done separately and in, in, in separate bits of hardware um, but that doesn't tend to be where we are in a system like Archer 2. Um, yeah so the clock speed as I've already said uh, determines the rate at which instructions can be executed and modern processes are somewhere between two and three gigahertz that hasn't changed for a long time uh, but that's generally because to push the clock speed higher requires uh, two things. It, it creates more heat waste inside the processes, uh, which is hard to get out of, and so sort of thermal limits that stop us pushing our clock speed higher. Uh, but it also has some kind of uh, power or energy uh, impact as well. So the, the faster your clock speed is, the more energy you're using, um, and so there is also a fixed amount of uh, energy you can get in and out of a processor at any one time um, and that impacts how fast you can push your clock speed uh, there are processors which do go faster you know you six six or seven gigahertz but they tend to have to be quite specialized um either in their design or in their cooling and, and power uh, setups the Processes can be quite complicated, um, as I've already said. So you can do integer and floating point calculations in parallel, multiple issues where you can do like an add and a multiply at the same time. And so and and there's lots of complexity in the hardware trying to improve performance automatically for you. So things like pipelining, out of order execution, speculative computation. These are all hardware features that modern processes tend to have to try and get around some of the bottlenecks and some of the performance issues you may have uh, running a general purpose application on a CPU. So there are things like um, realizing that to get good performance, they need to um, make sure that the data in registers is, is reused as much as possible, or that the uh, processor can be kept full with instructions at all times and so a lot of work goes into the hardware and into the compiler side and the software which we'll come to look at um, to try and get around these kind of things now um, we have been lucky over the past 40 years that that uh, processes and processing technology has improved um, as time has gone by um, so there's, there's always been this um, 
trend called Moore's law, which was uh, an observation that uh, the number of transistors you could put on a processor was sort of doubling every 18 months because of improvements in engineering processes and uh, manufacturing processes. Uh, and this is that held pretty true for a long time. And the nice thing about that is it, it let you do two things. It let you add more functionality to your processes and it also let you push the clock speed of your processes up. So the better the engineering um, approaches, the better the underlying technology being used, the faster you could run your processes. And that sort of tailed off about 10, 15 years ago uh, where it, it, we ran into some of these physical limits on power and heat. Um, which meant that um, we have now got to a point where processes are still getting more complicated and still getting uh, more functional, uh, but we've not been able to really keep pushing the speed of an in individual processor faster uh, every 18 months. So what happens now actually is that people are still improving the engineering to build silicon, to build uh, transistors and processors. But what it translates into is instead of getting a, a single processor which runs faster every two years, what you end up getting is a multi-core processors. So you get more cores on your processor every couple of years. So the power, what's happening now is we're getting more powerful processors over time, but that power is tending to come from adding more cores and more features on the processor rather than pushing that individual processor faster itself. So you'll see on Archer 2, we actually have two processors. Each has got 64 cores in it. When we, if I go back 15 years, you're getting processors where you had two cores in it. So you'd have two processors on a node, each would have two cores, you get, you'd have four cores in, in total. So over the past 15 years, we've seen the speed and power of of uh, individual processes go up by adding more and more things that can do work inside them. And um, so we have this uh, fine grained parallelism, which where we where people are increasing um, performance by doing more complex things inside the processor like pipelining. But then we have this medium and coarse grain parallelism, which uh, is what gives us most of our performance on, on processes now. So SIMD or, or vectorization on individual processing cores makes them faster and then adding multiple cores per chip makes the overall chip faster um, and that has you know performance impacts as well so uh, as we'll come on to look at the the way we use modern processors we generally have to use quite a lot of the cores to get the best performance out of them which need, means you need some parallelism in your program generally to get good performance um, or at least to maintain the performance to previous systems and then we need to try and optimize our hardware so that it works well on some of the features inside the chip which are giving us performance now so the vectorization the multi-threading and, and the pipelining and that's what we'll try and look at today and tomorrow if we had a look in a bit more detail at an individual processor, we can see they're made of functional units. So things that do work on the processor. Um, and there are a number of these, uh, the instruction unit. And this is what goes to memory and gets the program to be run. So fetching, decoding and dispatching instructions. Uh, and it also can do scheduling of, of a work on the CPU, then they'll likely be integer and floating point units, which do uh, the addition, multiplication, division, these kind of things for our integer side and our floating point side. And the integer unit generally handles logical operations as well. So ands and ors and, and nots. Um, and then there'll be a control unit, which looks for things like branches and jumps in the program and the load store unit which looks for which does the work of, of loading data from memory and storing data back to memory 
Now, why do we mention all these things? I mean, most of these things you shouldn't have to care about. They're just hardware details. They're things that are hidden from you because they of the way that programming works. You write a code and then a compiler turns that code into instructions and then those instructions are run for you on the process. So using all these units. Well, the re reason it's useful to understand is each one of these can be a performance bottleneck. So depending on what your code's doing, you could be limited by the number of instructions that can be run at any one time, um, the performance of the integer unit or the floating point units, the control unit. So if you have lots of jumps or branches, so if statements or loops in your program can also limit your performance because that can restrict some of the other things. And uh, finally, loading and storing data to and from memory can also be where your performance bottleneck is. So depending on what your application is doing, you may need to be aware of, okay, there are these underlying bits of hardware which we're mapping onto, and these are bits of hardware which are restricting the performance of my program. Is there any way I can restructure it or change it or optimize it to reduce some of the uh, reliance on or, or bottlenecks on these performance units? Um, and registers, as we've already mentioned, this local storage on the processor can also impact performance. So you can also have a you know impact on performance because you've run out of registers and, and things have to be moved to and from uh, memory to, to get around that. Now, one of the key things, techniques that have been used over the past 30 years for processes to make them more efficient is something called uh, pipelining. And this is where the execution of instructions is broken down into stages because an individual instruction is actually quite complicated. Um, and okay, so the question here so these low level instructions, are you talking about assembler not language? Uh, so at some level, assembler will map to these instructions the actual instructions themselves are slightly lower level than assembler uh, but yes you can think of these low level instructions as, as assembly and um, so for those of you who don't know assembly is what a program gets compiled down into it's a sort of basic instruction set for the computer you're running on so there'll be instructions like load like store like add like multiply um, in reality, those actually get converted right down into machine instructions. Um, so they get converted from assembler into uh, bit strings. Uh, but yes, fundamentally, those instructions we're talking about are at, at that similar level to assembly. Um, OK, so but because these instructions can be quite complicated and can could theoretically take uh, time on the processor, what happens if it tends to be broken down into stages? Um, and then each stage is executed in one CPU clock cycle. And then it moves on through a pipeline to do the next part of instruction and the next part of instruction and the next part of instruction. And that can be sort of a load operate store, or it could be a first part of my floating point instruction, second part of my floating point instruction, third part of my floating point instruction work kind of uh, approach. Uh, and so this is a way of increasing the clock speed or letting the clock speed run quickly, even for operations which take quite a, a lot of work. This is how pipelining works on modern processes. Um, so, uh, and what you need then is that the, the pipeline, the, the, the reason why this is useful is that even if something like a, a floating point instruction takes a few clock cycles, four, six clock cycles, and it relies on a load and a store and all these kind of things, if you have enough of them pipelined together, each going through separate stages of the operations, then once that pipeline is full, you can still complete an, an instruction every clock cycle because something comes off the end of a pipeline every clock cycle. And that means as long as you've got a full pipeline and, and no stalls in that pipeline, you can get good performance. 
Um, and so that's a great way of, of dealing with some of the complexities in modern CPUs to give you good performance. But of course, if you can't use that pipeline efficiently, um, then you will performance will reduce. So if you ever have to drain that pipeline down because you're not sure what instruction to run next, or if you're waiting for data to be loaded from memory before you can run the next instruction, then you get quite a big performance hit. So on this, um, on the Arch processes we're using here, there's a 19 stage pipeline that is run. And if that pipeline is not fill, full, you can imagine you end up then with a uh, 19 uh, cycle latency before you can refill that pipeline and get data flowing back through it and get your instructions being executed back through it. And so at that point, you, you've potentially drained down and you've, you've got 19 times slower performance because you're not actually uh, executing any instructions. Uh, uh, there we go. There are also some things that will not be pipelines. So some uh, operations will be expensive. So things like the square root, floating point square root and floating point divide may not work nicely with these, with these pipelines and, and may um, perform, uh, reduce performance because of, of what you're doing now. Now there are ways around this. Compilers will try and generate um, alternatives to square root and, and divide, which which can be pipelined and can give you high performance, albeit their different precision or a different uh, accuracy. Um, and, and and when we come to look at optimizing with a compiler, that's one of the things you can play around with is, is asking the compiler to generate you things like um, reduced uh, precision. Um, operations for some of the things that it's doing. So yeah, pipelining, stopping and starting a pipeline will waste cycles. Um, and some of the things that can cause this are what we will call structural hazards. That is two instructions both requiring the same hardware at the same time. Um, or one instruction depending on the result of another instructional instruction further down the pipeline. So like a data dependency between instructions where there's not enough other work to put between them to, to allow the result to be calculated before the next instruction needs it. Um, and then instructions changing what happens next. So um, what we call branches or jumps can change in your program what's going to happen next so you can imagine if you wrote a program and, and you had some code and then it said if a equals 10 do this else do something else um the program may when you run it not know what a is until it gets right to that point where it's got to decide is a equal to 10 or not and of course if that's the case it has to wait for a to be calculated before it can do that um comparison does a equal 10 or not before it can decide what instruction can be scheduled and so if a has not been calculated in the pipeline yet then it may have to wait drain down that pipeline find the result for a before it can decide what instruction to run next uh, in fact this last one here this kind of hazard um this control hazard on on, on performance for for cpus is, is one of the ones that has caused lots of problems for press and manufacturers over the past few years. Because one way around this is to add in hardware, which does what we call speculative execution. And that will say, well, I don't know if A is equal to 10 or not, but I'm just going to assume A is equal to 10, run the next instructions. And then if it turns out I was wrong, then I need to roll back. But if I was right, I can just keep going and I never see a, a pipeline issue. I never see a performance issue and as long as I can do that branch prediction nicely and there's generally hardware in the process of do branch prediction uh, then I can avoid it but of course this can be a, a, a security issue because if you don't handle it correctly you've ended up doing things in the processor which it wasn't allowed to do uh, so effectively calculating bits of, of on, on bits of memory or data or, or exposing bits of memory or data that were never going to be allowed because they sat behind these you know if uh, statements um, and so uh, we've had a, a number of uh, of security issues 
over the past few years, which have been around uh, that kind of speculative execution hardware not working properly. And so there, there was a, a, a set of uh, bugs on Intel CPUs uh, about six or seven years ago now called the uh, Spectre and Meltdown bugs, which were based exactly on this, tricking the CPU into executing some code which it shouldn't have done and then even when it rolled back it left some data lying around that it shouldn't have done and, and that was a, a performance issue so the processor and the compiler will do some work to try and get around some of these issues so we've seen branch prediction here uh, this is hardware it's added to say can we guess where we will go after this if statement or after this um, end of this loop because you've got to remember that a lot of computational simulation applications are based on loops uh, where you loop over data, you know, can loop over, say, a two dimensional matrix and do some operations on that. And actually, at the end of a loop, a do loop or a for loop or a while loop, there is generally a, an if statement. You don't see it, but that's how they're, they're, um, the underlying, underlying language to, compiles that down into something that will run. So when you get to the end of the loop, it'll say if I'm, you know, my loop counter is less than your loop bound, go back to the beginning, otherwise keep going. Um, and so there is hardware built into processes to try and predict these things. Uh, because if you've got to imagine, if you've got a loop over a million things, then nine, 999,999 times you can predict that, that loop will do the correct thing. It will keep going around the loop, keep going around the loop. So for the whole pipeline you're running that until you get to the end, you can predict, you don't have to wait and see is, is the loop counter um, less than this. You can predict that it will be and, and just keep going. So that's built in in the hardware level. And then when you get to the end of a loop, of course, it'll make the wrong prediction. And then you have to uh, deal with the consequences. And so there'll be a pipeline drain and, and uh, some invalidated results and, and that's fine. But as long as that happens once for every million iterations, it doesn't. It, it shouldn't be a big performance impact. Most modern processes will also do out of order execution, so that also means they can take all the instructions that are going to be run, work out a dependency graph on them, uh, and then reorder them so that it can maybe put in extra instructions between places that will cause pipeline stalls. For instance, if you want to. If you've got an instruction that depends on the result of a previous instruction, can you maybe put in some separate things doing different work between those two things so they're far enough separated in the pipeline they don't cause a stall? And so compilers and, and the hardware will also run these out of order executions to execute the program not necessarily in the way in the in the order it was written, but as long as it, it, it produces results that are equivalent, uh, they'll do that kind of work as well. Um, inside this hardware, because we can do pipelining and we can uh, uh, run out of order execution, that also enables the hardware to do instruction level parallelism. So this means using more than one thing at once per clock cycle. So because we've got a a load store unit and an integer unit and a floating point unit and a control unit, um, all those kind of things, then we don't have to only be using one of them any one time. We could actually be using both the load store and the floating point unit at any one time. And so this is what we call instruction level parallelism. So super scale uh, processes where they can run more than one bit of hardware per clock cycle. And of course, if you can do that, then you can effectively retire multiple instructions per clock cycle, and that can give you performance improvements. And then the other instruction level parallelism we can sort of see is uh, vector instructions as well. And we'll come on to talk about those tomorrow. But these are where the hardware is set up to run one instruction, but on multiple bits of data at once. And that can improve performance as well. Um, so the superscalar instructions will, 
it are enabled in the hardware using this outer order execution um, to, so you can issue certain things in the same time. Um, the detection of independent instructions is done at the hardware level. So the hardware, the processor will be, instruct, will be fetching a whole bunch of things to run at one time and then decide what to uh, run on each one of those. And so there's complex hardware in there to work out are the dependencies and what can we run here. Um, and the compiler will help with this as well uh, by trying to group together sets of instructions which are independent uh, in, in those kind of things. And then, as I say, when we come on to um, vectorization hardware, this kind of single instruction, multiple data approaches, um, then we we see uh, that being modern, uh, you know, uh, heavily used in modern processors. Uh, and in fact, this is what GPUs are to some level. You can you can imagine, you can think of a GPU as a big vector processor where it can do a single instruction on multiple bits of hardware at once. But they are slightly different because GPUs are what we call uh, single instruction, multiple threads, rather than single instruction, multiple data, because it gives them a bit more freedom to run uh, different hardware threads at the same time. Uh, but on a, on a processor like uh, Archer 2, um, or on other similar processors, you can typically run sort of four or eight um, floating point instructions at once. So it's the same instruction, you know, we're going to do an add, but instead of doing it on one piece of data, we can do it on eight pieces of data at once. So that's what, what, what the vectorization in the SIMD hardware does for us. And this can be very useful for us in, in computational simulation, because if we're going through a loop and we're doing the same, say we've got a two-dimensional uh, matrix, uh, and we want to do the same piece of work to every element in that matrix, um, when we loop through that uh, one after another, get each element and, and loop through it, do the same instructions, we can say instead of doing, using these, these vectorized instructions, instead of doing each element at a time, we can do eight elements at a time, apply the same instructions to each element and get the same results. And that means we should be able to go eight times faster uh, by doing that. And um, there are some challenges around doing this vectorization. So particularly on, on these processes, it um, requires your, uh, source code to be in certain um, using certain patterns and, and certain formats so the compiler can easily recognize what can be vectorized and what can't be vectorized uh, and that puts some restrictions on things so it, it can be one of the areas where people struggle to get good performances by it is to ensure that they're getting good use of a vector uh, functionality on these kind of modern processors and that may require some code restructuring and even some hand um hand coded parts where you explicitly call vector uh, instructions directly rather than relying on the compiler to do that but we'll come back and look at that as well one of the other areas that we haven't talked about yet at all though is uh, our, our caches so we have this um characteristic these days where uh, memory is much slower than processors and to get around that performance impact, it can easily take you know a few hundred cycles to load something from memory to your processor. If you had to do that for everything, then your processor would be run a few hundred times slower than it should be. Um, and so to get around that, uh, there is fast local storage on the processors we call cache. So cache is, is much slower than, sorry, much smaller than main memory. So on Arch 2, we've got 256 gigabytes of, of main memory, say, on a node, but our caches will only be a few few megabytes or a few hundred megabytes. Uh, but there tend to be these different levels of caches, level one, level two, level three, which are faster and smaller. So generally, level three cache is shared with all the cores on a chip, and it tends to be the biggest level of cache, but still slower than the processor. And then level one cache could be something like a megabyte in size, but it's, it's much quicker. It sort of takes something like eight, 10 cycles to get some data to and from that. So it's much, much quicker than the hundreds of cycles it would take to get out to main memory. And so that's another feature which is heavily used to get good performance. 
if you can make sure that you're always working on data which is in cache rather than in main memory um, then you'll be getting data much quicker and you won't be having any of these stalls in your pipelines waiting for data to be loaded and, and stored but that again depends on your data access and memory access patterns to give you good performance when it comes to these multi-core processors like we've got here then we have these multiple levels of cache uh, and so generally um, each core will have its own L1 and L2 cache but it will share, share an L3 cache and it will share access to main memory so there can also be scenarios and, and Mark will come onto this I think tomorrow in some of the OpenMP things where you get an interaction between uh, all the processors trying to use the same uh, resources in the L3 cache or down to a main memory which can also impact performance as well so once we start looking beyond an individual worker to how you use the, the processes in general and how you run multiple workers at once there can be some areas you can optimize to efficiently use things like shared cache and, and memory resources um, and so these are some of the things only you know there's a there's a this contention for shared spaces and in, in, in caches and, and shared resources like those kind of things modern processors as we've already seen um let, can do this this super scalar issue where they can run multiple uh units at once functional units at once and this is nice this can give us performance improvements uh, but actually if you look at most applications um, the most applications won't be using all the functional units at the same time um, and so what hardware manufacturers have, have built around this is this idea of running more than one piece of work on the processor at the same time to try and use up some of those spare functional units and not being exploited and this is sometimes called hyperthreading, sometimes called simultaneous multi-threading um, but the idea here is added in a little bit of extra functionality on the processor so instead of being only running one program at once we can run two programs or threads on the processor at the same time because you need a bit more registers you need to keep track of what's running but if you run two programs at once uh, then you may be able to use up some of those hardware slots that are not being used by running two different workloads at the same time so here's an example if we were running two threads on the on two separate workers on two separate cores then they would take in this example six clock cycles so each row is a clock cycle and uh, each column is a functional unit that's being used um, and so that the first column could for instance be the load store unit and the second could be the integer unit and the third could be the floating point unit etc etc so if we ran these two separately using two cores, the example would say we would take six clock cycles to run all this code. But on a on a processor user hyperthreading or symmetric multi-threading, actually if we run them both on one core at the same time, but overlapping what they can use. So you can see in the first clock cycle, they use an entirely different floating point uh, functional units. So they can both run at the same time. And then in the second clock cycle, they're mainly using different functional units, but you can see there's an overlap here between the red and the blue on the fourth column that will push it out a little bit. And um, so that's the idea with, with hyperthreading or symmetric multithreading is that you can run two workers at the same time on the same piece of hardware and exploit the fact that they may be using different bits of the processor and that lets you fill up the processor pipeline more efficiently uh, and get your program running in this example here we've, we've used only one core instead of using two cores and it's taken one clock cycle longer so it, it's gone you know we've used half the resources and it's now one one sixth uh, uh, slower than it was before uh, and that's the idea of hyperthreading so systems like Archer 2 can do hyperthreading um, that can mean instead of having 128 workers on a node you can run up to 256 workers on a node um, the challenge with it is for most of the things we run for high performance computing um, actually you run in copies of the same program doing the same thing so they tend to always be using the same floating point units or the same load store units 
And so there doesn't tend to be much overlapping that can be done. So for most of what we do in, in high performance computing, it doesn't tend to actually make much sense to do this um, hyper threading, but you can do it and you can try it out yourself. So you can take your program, you can run it on 128 cores, and then you can run it on 256 cores on the same hardware. So double up the amount of workers you're using and that will still run and you can see if it gives you any performance benefits or not. In general, for sort of normal applications, you can get a 20 or 30% speed up. Uh, but for a lot of computational simulation, the kind of things we run on Archer 2, you don't see very much benefit at all because um, they're competing for same floating point units or because they are generally memory band bound anyway. And so they're all, all waiting for the same loads and stores to come in from, from memory. And because you're sharing that load store unit, uh, there, there's, there's a, a, a contention on resources and that, and that doesn't help either. Uh, as we've said, GPUs um, are uh, a way of speeding up performance as well. Uh, so these are specialized bits of hardware which um, can do more floating point operations because they have more hardware dedicated to them, but can't run everything. So they can't be used to uh, to run the, you know, they can't be used by themselves. And um, the challenges there is not all applications easily port to GPUs. So they, they're not as general purpose as CPUs. And, and so there'll be some applications that can use them very efficiently and, and some that can't. Um, and uh, we, we don't have them on Archer 2. It's likely we'll have them on future resources. And if you are interested in GPUs, we, we, there are them, uh, they are available on, on other HPC systems, which are funded by UKRI. Uh, particularly, uh, we run a tier two service called Cirrus, which has a bunch of GPUs in it. And there are a number of those um, around the country as well. Um, so memory, um, as I've already discussed a little bit, is, is sort of key for our um, programs. So we need to uh, store our data somewhere whilst we're working on it. Um, and it's often the limiting factor for HPC systems because memory has not improved at the same rate in terms of performance as processors it can generally take a long time to load data from memory into the CPU. It is actually uh, possible to make um, memory which is much faster. Uh, it just takes a lot more transistors and it takes a lot more energy to run. Um, and so that's why we have end up with these big slow memories um, using uh, what we call DRAM. Uh, rather than these small, fast memories, which, which are, are used for cache, which is what's called SRAM. Uh, and um, so memory is often a key limiting factor for high performance computing applications. Um, a lot of applications are what we call uh, uh, memory bandwidth bound or memory bound um, because it takes a long time to, to uh, get the data in and out. We have these caches, which are one way of getting around this. Um, and so we have already discussed this, but we have these caches and, and this, uh, the figures on here don't really uh, matter. They're, they're probably slightly out of date now in terms of the actual number of cycles and the actual capacity on, on each of those kind of things. For instance, the L3 cache on a, on a modern AMD processor, like we have in Archer 2, is, is pretty big now. It can be up into the hundreds of, gigabyte, of megabytes of, of memory. Uh, but the sort of order of this still makes, uh, it still holds in that we have registers which run at the speed of a processor and we have main memory which runs much slower than the processor. And there are a bunch of caches that sit in between to um, smooth out those costs. And so if you can work on data, it's always in, in the level one cache, then you probably won't see any performance impact of working on that data. If you happen to fetch data in and out from main memory all the time, you'll see a, long, uh, a large um, slowdown. So we don't need to go into too much detail here, but, but caches and uh, memory um, controllers on modern processors do a lot of work to automatically move data in and out. 
for us and um, hold data in this fast memory so we can reuse it uh, in the future. We'll also do, the, the processes will also do some automatic moving and data in for what we call prefetching, uh, which is to try and get you data which is likely to be used in, in the future um, as well. Uh, and why do we care about all this stuff? Well, if we can design our programs in such a way which we where we make good reuse of cache data, or we have data access patterns, which are easy to predict uh, and map well onto the hardware, that will give us better performance than if we are going to be jumping around in memory and if we're going to be accessing random parts of our data structures. And caches themselves, they're built on this idea of locality, uh, temporal and spatial locality, i.e. if we've used something, if we've used a piece of data, we're likely to use that piece of data again soon. That's temporal locality. And if we've used some data, we're likely to use some data close to it in memory soon, i.e. spatial locality. So you can imagine again, if we've got an array of a million elements, we start at the beginning, it's likely we're going to move element by element through that array. And that means if we've, we've used one bit of data, we're likely to use its neighbor quite soon as well and move on like that. Um, and so the caches will load up chunks of data from our memory and then hold it for us to, to use. But of course, they're limited in size. So they load up data in these cache blocks, somewhere between 32 and 128 bytes. I think on Archer 2, it's 64 bytes, but I, I could be wrong. This is a cache, cache block, uh, or what we also know as a cache line. Um, and the data is loaded into cache and then worked on. But of course, our caches are limited in size. Um, and so you can't store all the data in there. And so when new data is required, some, old, some existing data will be kicked out. Um, and so there is a set of functionality to do this where you where the, the processors, because we've got to be fairly automatic about this, you can't have very complex control logic doing this, uh, where the, the cache uh, uh, and the memory controller will come in and say, okay, what was the, where, where is this data going to go? And we generally put that into uh, blocks in a set. Um, and then, uh, so this is the idea here, is you've got some data in your memory, that maps into a cache block and a cache set. And then when new data has to be loaded up, it will get rid of some of the data that already exists in that cache block and that cache set. And, and generally that's sort of a, done on a least, a least recently used um, idea. So you keep track of what data has been accessed in the cache recently and that the, the oldest bit of data gets thrown out. Um, so you can imagine again here, if we can design our programs in such a way that they reuse data in the cache efficiently, then we're always going to be using data that's in the cache and we're, we're not going to have these issues of having to load data in and out or, or our data falling out of the cache and then having to reload it back in there. And there's lots of hardware. We, we won't go through the details here, but it's in the lectures if you're interested. There's lots of hardware uh, functionality which, which decides what data goes where in the cache. Uh, and that can be useful to know when you're optimizing your programs because you can sort of work out um, do I have a sensible cache access pattern here or, or not here. And then there are different policies on whether you read uh, and write data uh, back to the cache or, or uh, maintain it in the cache. Um, so there's a good question here. Is this the caching similar to pages such as used in MS Windows? Um, paging is something that's slightly different. Um, but uh, but sort of conceptually similar. So paging tends to be um, loading chunks of memory to and from um, a, a defined space. Uh, and so uh, we all we also do paging on on these kind of systems. But paging generally is controlling the memory space rather than the caching um, space. And on a on a program. If you've got a computer where you've got less memory than you need, then what will happen with paging is, is some of the memory pages, which tend to be a bit bigger here, they tend to be four kilobytes or, or, or bigger than that, um, rather than cache blocks being 32 or 64 bytes, they're just sort of four kilobytes or, or higher. 
um, and those pages will be swapped out to a storage device, to a disk. Uh, and so that's sort of another level of caching uh, at a lower, um, lower uh, size speed uh, thing. But it's a similar kind of approach, uh, but not, not exactly the same. It is paging. And now I've lost my window. There we go. Uh, and this complexity is what happens when we read and write data to the caches as well. Now, again, we generally don't need to go into this level of detail, but once you start optimizing very, very finely, then these are the kind of things you may care about. So it's here, it's in the slides. You may want to come back to it later and see, okay, what are we actually doing here um, in general? But it's a, an important metric for performance profile and performance optimization is, is cache hit and cache miss ratios. Um, so the cache uh, hit and the cache miss uh, will tell you how efficiently you're using those caches. You know, are you reusing the data that's in them, or are you off, often having to go out to main memory and uh, or, or to a low level cache and load that data up? Um, as we've just briefly discussed from the, the question that was kicked off there, uh, there is this idea of also virtual memory inside processes, and this lets you. Man, the processor and the application, the operating system, manage the memory space uh, effectively, and they do this through pages. Um, so main memory can be thought of as a cache of what's on disk, uh, separated into blocks called pages, um, and then they're swapped in and out uh, or created as required as well. Um, and this is what happens in, in the processor. So there's something called a um, a TLB, which um, stores the location of uh, mapping of virtual memory into physical memory for you. Um, and then that is uh, how the processor itself and the operating system deal with allocating it and giving out memory. Again, most of this detail you don't need to uh, care about. It's below. Um, below what's the level of detail you generally need to go into, but it has some performance implications for your application. So accessing uh, memory from a, a new page, so creating a new page, doing what we call a page fault, um, can be expensive. It involves going out to the operating system and asking it to give you a page and, and all these kind of things. And so this page faulting is something we try and avoid. And it generally happens when you create new memory. So when your program allocates new memory, it will get given a page. When it uses that page up, it'll get given another page. When it uses that page up, it gets given another page. And that means there can be some performance implications. If you do lots of small memory creates and, and destroys, uh, you know, freeing up and creating memory a lot of the time, that can have some performance impact on your program as well. And it's because of some of these underlying processes which are happening when you're doing memory um, memory uh, lookups and memory creations. And part of that is handled by this uh, TLB and the, the hardware, which is a hardware cache inside the processor itself. Prefetching, as we've already mentioned, is an automatic uh, piece of optimization which the processor may do for you, which is to go and get data and, and store it if you have these access patterns which are uh, regular and uh, predictable. Um, so it can get in data before you actually need it, which is quite nice. Um, again, most of the time this is automatic for you. Most of the time you don't care what's going on, it just happens. But there are ways to, or to trigger it manually. If you know your program has a access pattern which is a bit different which is not triggering a prefetching you can add in instructions in your program to say i know i'll need this data in in two cycles in two loop iterations time prefetch it now and we've seen people do those optimizations quite nicely in the past where they um, manually control this kind of thing themselves um, So there's a, uh, another question here. If doing an operation involving two arrays, does the cache tend to have parts of both array at the same time, or does it throw out one array for the other one every operation? Again, this really depends on your cache sizes, your array sizes, and your access patterns. 
if you've just got two arrays that you're working through, most of the time they should map to different cache blocks or cache sets because you've got a, you know, say an eight way cache. Uh, so it has eight entries per, per set. So if you only had two arrays, it would be able to keep both of those in that at the same time. And so hopefully you wouldn't have what, what, what you're um, describing here, which we call cache thrashing, where you're constantly invalidating and re-importing data backwards and forward. So for most nice and straightforward access patterns, it should be able to hold both the arrays in there at once. But you will get pathological cases where you do get the scenario where there's some interaction that means that some of the data you've just used gets thrown away and then you have to get it back again. And uh, I think Mark will talk a little bit about that tomorrow for OpenMP, um, but you can see those these things happening. So if you if you profile your program and you uh, and it turns out that it has high cash um misses uh, then it could be one of these scenarios and you have to have a look how do i get around this can i do things like slightly pad some of my arrays so it offsets them in memory so they don't, don't map to the same place in the cache uh, and they don't have those kind of interactions or can i change my access pattern so i'm not accessing it in this order of access in this slightly different order which which maps more nicely into the cache Um, there's also a lot more complexity going on under the hood um, in our caches because we have these multi-core processors and they all have access to the same memory in the same level three caches, for instance. The processor has to keep track of who's accessing what memory and, and to ensure coherency of data. So that two cores, if you access the same memory at the same time, um, we can't, you don't end up with a scenario where they both have different values of that data and those different values get to interact with each other in such a way that you get incorrect results in your program. So there is also a system to, to main cache coherency. Um, and there's different ways that this is done. We don't need to go through the details. It's here in case you're interested. Um, but that can mean that um, they, the processor is doing work which can cause interactions with your cache by by saying, oh, okay, another cause uh, updated the data you have in your cache. So your now your cache line is no longer valid. You'll have to go and fetch that back from memory or from where that other data, that other core has the data. Uh, and that can also cause these cache invalidations as well. And that will happen, that can cause a performance um, scenario we call false sharing here, uh, where actually because cache lines are, are not individual bits of data but can be say 32 or 64 or 128 bytes uh, you can have different processes working on different bits of data but they're in the same cache line and because the coherency is done on the cache line level uh, they keep invalidating each other's cache lines and we keep having to go back to memory and get the data back again and that can slow down performance as well and so those kind of things can happen generally this is more if you're working on in shared memory if you do an open mp programming style of things because you're working on the same bits of data but even if you look at your program and say well actually they're all all my workers are using different bits of data there shouldn't be any problem here because of the way caches work because of the coherency protocols and the size of cache lines that can also uh, generate some performance impact as well. And then just coming to the end of this here, I realize we're somewhat over time. Uh, but as I say, we've got time to make up for that this afternoon because we've got loads of time in the in the practical sessions this afternoon. And uh, some of the other lectures don't take as long. Um, we have, uh, particularly in something like Archer 2, we have this hardware where we've got these multiple processors um, and we have uh, memory attached to both processor um, and so we have this idea where we have memory and processors connected together and now you could build these in you can imagine these here each uh, m here is a separate arch2 node and it's a network connecting them together but we see the same thing inside an arch2 system because this is what an arch2 node actually looks like so inside an arch2 node we have two processors each of these AMD EPIC 7742 processors, 
and each one of those um, will have 128 gigabytes of memory attached to it, unless we're on the big memory nodes. Um, and any core can access any of the memory. So a core on the left-hand processor can access some of the memory on the right-hand processor. And that means the whole node has 256 gigabytes of memory. But if you are a core on the left-hand processor, accessing memory, accessing data in memory in the right-hand processor is a slower than if you access it in the local memory to your processor here. Um, and so we have this idea of a non-uniform memory access architecture where it costs you a bit more to access some memory than it does other memory. And in this scenario, each processor has 128 gigabytes. They can access their local 128 gigabytes faster than if they have to go across this interconnect between processors to get that other 128 gigabytes. Uh, and this is what we call a uh, cache coherent NUMA, non-uniform in memory access architecture, which means we can access all the data in the whole node, but if we understand that some of the memory is closer than others, we get better performance because we access local memory, which is faster, and we don't have to go across those kind of uh, external uh, memory buses which go between processors. And again, you can design your programs to take this into account. Mostly processors, uh, programs will allocate data in their local memory, if there is any available, uh, and then only spill over into the remote memory once they've exhausted data that's locally uh, available or uh, memory space that's locally available. But certain ways of accessing on, or configuring data, particularly in OpenMP programming or shared memory programming, can cause you to access data in, in, in other parts of a processor without meaning to. For instance, if you have one worker which creates all the memory arrays and, and populates them, and then all the workers work on those, then all that data will be created in the local memory to the worker which created it in the first instance, regardless of where the other workers that you end up using it are based. And this is what we call first touch initialization. And again, you can get around um, performance issue problems there by just understanding uh, the characteristics of the nodes here. So um, it's been a, a long winded discussion of lots and lots of hardware features. Uh, and I, I yeah, appreciate uh, there's a lot of detail in there. Um, apologies. You don't need to know it all, but it is worth being aware that these are some of the features which are going on under the hood in the processor, which we can then look to target to make sure that we're getting good performance out of our processor. So this is why it can be a compl complex uh, problem to optimize applications efficiently. But it also shows you how much clever stuff is going on here. So there's a lot of clever stuff going on in compilers and in the hardware to, to use all this stuff in the background. We don't have to do any work for it. It just happens for us. But then if we know about it, there's maybe some things we can do to e improve performance even further. On um, Archer 2, we're, as I say, we're running with these AMD EPIC 7742 processors, the 64 cores per processor. They generally run at a 2.25 gigahertz clock speed. That actually is variable on the system. So they, they, it's possible to run at uh, somewhere between 2 gigahertz and 2.7 gigahertz, depending on some of the settings. Uh, if, if you're interested in that, uh, let me know, because I can give you some of the details on that. But basically, quite recently, we, we turned the processor down to 2 gigahertz by default, because that actually saves some energy and doesn't make most people's process programs go slower. Uh, but it does make some programs go slower. And so you can turn it back up to um, higher clock speed. That is possible. Um, and then each processor has a two floating point vector units. Each of those can do um, a fuse multiply add. So it can do an FMA at once. Um, and each one of those can do four, four floating point operations per cycle if you use this vectorization hardware efficiently. And that means we can do 16 floating point operations per core per clock cycle using all those things put together. So it has to be doing the fuse multiplier adds and it has to be doing vectorization. Uh, if we can do all that, we can get about four 
terabytes, uh, teraflops, sorry, of floating point operations per compute node. But that relies on your program being amenable to vectorization, being amenable to these fuse multiply adds where you can do an add and a multiply in the same instruction, being able to use all the cores and not being memory bandwidth bound. Uh, so not uh, so being able to efficiently use the cache um, sensibly as well. And the H2 nodes can do this symmetric multi-threading, um, but as I've said, uh, so you can run up to 256 things per node. As I said, for most applications, it doesn't make much sense, but it's something you can play around with and see if it, if it does make sense for your application. Um, yes, so Andrew, yeah, so we had, um, we had, there was a lot of discussion over this, the slowdown on, on the clock speed. Um, effectively, for most applications, it doesn't make a difference because a lot of the applications on Archer 2 are memory bandwidth bound, so they're not limited by the speed of a processor per se. Uh, but there are different applications where it does make a performance impact. The sort of the nice thing about it is it lets us it lets you save electricity. So we I think we went from something like 3.5 to just under three megawatts by by making these changes to, to the overall system so you sort of were saving 20 percent of the electricity being used uh, but it definitely can impact your performance um, so it's it's easy to, to test because it's just when you submit a job you change the parameters of a job and that can change the uh, frequency of a processor and you can see actually what's the performance impact of, of running at a slightly slower um, clock frequency. Okay. We have a set of um, higher sizes here. So there's, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, sort of, let, you know, L1, L2 caches and an L3 cache. Um, and then there's uh, various sort of latencies on the on the on those as well, right? So bandwidths and latencies. So uh, again, these details you don't need to memorize or don't need to care about too much. But when we come back to actually optimizing applications, you may want to say, well, okay, um, am I fitting within the L2 cache? Am I fitting real uh, L3 cache? Uh, and and those kind of things. Uh, but yes. And those are the kind of raw figures for the memory and the, the cache hierarchy. Um, and the, the processor itself has this sort of uh, four memory regions per processor. And so, and again, this may have changed uh, slightly recently. I need to check that actually. But basically, basically, we have these NUMA regions. So there's the two processors which have uh, different memory access times depending on where you're going to and from. Um, and then inside each processor, they tend to have these little groups as well, where there's, it's, say, 16 cores per memory region, where you have slightly faster access inside those than you do go into data and other ones. Most applications don't care about this, but if you are either doing pure shared memory, so pure threaded or OpenMP programs, or you do what we call hybrid, which is an MPI plus an OpenMP program. You care about this because you care about uh, how you efficiently place your threads in the right places to get good performance. And if you're running a program where you don't need to use all the cores, you don't want to use all the cores on a node because, say, you need more memory per process that's running. So there's 256 gigabytes a node, you could run 128 things that would be two gigabytes a core uh, but actually if you needed say four gigabytes a core you'd um, go only run 64 things per node uh, and if you're running that scenario what we call underpopulating then you sort of you also need to care about where you're placing things because you don't want to underpopulate and put all your workers on the first processor on the first 64 cores and leave the second processor, the second 64 cores empty, because then you won't get the best performance. You probably want to spread them out. So you have 32 processes on the first core and 32 processes on the second core, 
And that's what we call sort of process placement and pinning, and that can be beneficial in terms of performance as well. Okay, uh, apologies, that was a bit of a marathon, um, but it sets us up for the, for the rest of the day uh, and for tomorrow, um, because we'll come back to see some of those issues at, at various points. If there's any more questions? There's been a couple as we've gone along, but any more questions now? We've got to the end of the um, the hardware which is inside a, an individual Archer 2 compute node and some of the features that may have impact on your performance. Right, okay, so we are um, behind the times, we're on a break. Um, I would suggest that we take our break now. We come back at uh, 11.40 um, and we'll go into, well, I'll go into is the next lecture at 11.40 on profiling, which is much shorter, and then we can come back and pick up both the practical exercises after that. Um, as I mentioned, if you haven't yet tried Access and Archer, now's a good time to do it, because um, we can then come back uh, and sort out any problems you have during this break before we go into the next session. Um, so if you've not tried to activate your Archer 2 account, or you've not tried to log into your Archer 2 account, then do give it a go now um, and we'll we'll come back. So as I say, uh, we'll take a break. We'll come back at 11.40 um, into the next lecture, unfortunately, and then we'll get some hands-on um, practical experience. And if you have any questions in the meantime, drop them in the, in the chat, drop me an email, and um, we'll be around here. So if you try and access Archer 2 and you have any problems, just let us know. We can sort them out. Okay, so we'll do this profiling lecture and then we can get back to the practicals. I should be able to get this profiling lecture done, famous last words, before the half 12 point where we're going to be doing a practical anyway, and then we can do practicals up till lunch, up till one. Uh, and then have a break for an hour then as well. Um, as I say, if you've had any problems or you've not tried to get access Archer yet, now is a good time to do it still uh, because we still haven't started a practical. So it's worth trying it out. Otherwise, we shall get going with the uh, um, profiling lecture. So for performance optimization, to try and improve the performance of your program, it's key to understand the performance before you start. And this is what profiling is. Profiling is saying um, we need to understand where the time has been spent in that program, what it looks like on the hardware we're using before we try and make it faster. Because it could be that it's as fast as it could possibly be. And it could be that the program could be optimized, but you don't know where. You may think you know where the time has been spent in the program, but without checking first, you may make assumptions which are wrong. So profiling is analyzing your code to work out where the time is being spent. Uh, and actually, you can go more in depth than that. You can do sort of hardware profiling where you look at how efficiently you're using the hardware as well. So you look at uh, how many cache misses there were, how many floats and point operations that you achieved, all those kind of things. And these are essential to let us, these two things are essential to let us decide where we're going to target our optimizations. There's no point you trying to improve the performance of a particular part of the code if it's not actually you know, dominating the runtime or important for the runtime. Because there's always a trade-off when we optimize a code between making a code faster and damaging some of the other features like maintainability, readability, understandability, these kind of things. Because generally, hopefully, we write codes that are easy to understand, easy to test, correct, etc., etc. Um and 
then beyond that, we look to make sure that they're performant. Um, and some of the changes we may make to improve performance may damage some of the things like portability and, and maintainability. So code profiling is, a, is our first step in this. And it basically, it's a way of adding extra features into the code, which will then report back to you time spent in various parts of the code. Now, you could do this manually. You could go through and put your own timers in. But that tends to be quite an intrusive, time-consuming job to do. And the nice thing is that compilers will let you do this automatically. So profiling, particularly when done by compilers, is the process of automatically adding in some sort of login data, which will record when various parts of the code were run for and for how long, and then reporting that to you at the end. The reason that we don't do this routinely, we don't run the codes with profile intended on all the time, is it can cost performance. So it can cost some runtime because you're adding extra functionality to the code, which will consume some resources. Um, and so we, it, it, compilers won't do it by default, but you can turn it on. Standard profiling will turn things like the number of functions that were called, how long those functions ran for, and even all the way down to how long an individual line of code took to run and how often that individual line of code took to run. And you can imagine that there's some trade-off between high-level profiling where you're just getting a, an overview of the, the main bits of the code down to very fine-grained profiling where you're looking at every single line of code can have a, a you know varying impact on the runtime of your code. So if you're trying to profile every single line, that can take much longer to do than if you're profiling just basic function calls and those kind of things. Um, and as I've also said, there are also tools that will do hardware-specific things. It'll tell you things like cache misses, uh, TLB misses, cache reuse, flop rates, those kind of things. And they can be important for uh, in-depth performance optimization, those kind of things. OK, so what does that look like? Uh, we've got two kinds of profilers. We've got sampling, we've got tracing. Um, so sampling is this idea of actually just you don't change the code particularly. You just interrupt the code when it's running at regular intervals, say 100 times a second, um, and then just ask the program counter, which is a thing which keeps track of what instruction is running, where um, where are you in the program at the moment? And so this is what we would call sampling. Um, and that is a sort of lets you build a nice, easy statistical picture of where the time is being spent. Okay, so it's pretty low overhead. You're interrupting the code. You are impacting performance, but uh, not uh, massively. Um, but you're not going to get a really detailed picture of where things are running. OK, so it's a statistical picture. It's looking at what functions have been run, not individual code lines. And it relies on you know, a real, a relatively long runtime and a relatively stable code base. So you're not calling lots of different functions all the time to get you a good uh, profile here. But it's a, it's a sensible place to start. Uh, and that's what we, we can look at with uh, uh, basic profiling. So that's sampling approach. Tracing is more detailed, and that can record data on exit to entry to every function. So that adds in code to your program so that when a function is called and when a function finishes, it records that data somewhere um, with a timestamp. Um, uh, and that can have higher overheads, have more effect on the runtime, and can actually, if you're running for large profiles, produce you lots of output data. Um, and you can go even more in depth from that. As I say, you can look at individual lines of codes if you want to. The standard, uh, and it says Unix here, I should really have that to, to, to say Linux these days. Um, there's a couple of standard profilers which come with, with Linux. 
um, Prof and GProf, um, and they're uh, they're pretty basic, but they do uh, a good job at what they're, they're designed to do. Um, so generally, they do slightly different things. Uh, Prof is basic, and GProf has a bit more functionality built on it. We'll come to see. And they're compiled, but they're enabled using compiler flags. So a minus P or a minus PG flag when you build your code will enable these kind of profiling things. Okay, so minus P will, will turn on prof profiling and minus PG will turn on GProf. Basically, prof will just give you the flat call tree that it sees and GProf will also give you the ancestry of all the functions so which function called what other function so it gives you more of a hierarchy of, of calls so you compile your program you then run it and then it produces an output file and generally it'll produce a file called mon.out or gmon.out uh, and then that's used by this prof or gprof program to tell you what's going on so here's an example of a thing called my program my prog, which created a mon.out, and I have a thing called prof, my prog. Then you can see here it tells me the percentage and the total number of runtime on each function call, uh, how many times that function was called, and the name of it. So this is a pretty basic, pretty small program. We only ran for less than a second. Uh, well, sorry, no, we only ran for just over two seconds. You know, generally this would be a little bit short for profiling, um, but it's given me something here. Um, and we can see that 30% of a runtime is in a function called relax, which is called 14 times. Another 30% is in something called res ID, which is also called 14 times. So between those two, I've got about 60% of a runtime. They're not called very often each, so that would suggest that they're both reasonably large so if i did some work in optimizing those i should get some performance benefits and then we've got a whole bunch of other stuff going on here now this we can tell is a fortran program because there's things called f90 close f90 slr i4 uh, read now these are this probably means there's about 15 percent maybe 20 percent of the runtime of this is in uh, file operations and again i could look at optimizing those Although I'd hope that if I run this program for longer, then the file operations wouldn't take so much time. Uh, I can see there's a thing called mCount here, which is taking up about 6% of a runtime. This is actually the profiling function that's been added, which wakes up, uh, asks where the code is, and then it goes back to sleep. And so this is the overhead of profiling here. So it's about 6% of a runtime. You can see it's called a lot. So each call is tiny, it's called a lot, um, and that's uh, that's what's going on there. Um, and then the rest is probably you know uh, irrelevant. GProf produces something similar, looks like that, but it also will give you a program call tree sorted by inclusive times. So you can see which are the most expensive functions, and then for those functions, what do they call, and and, and see everything in between. Um, You'll often see things turning up here that are not functions that you've written. So these examples of these Fortran uh, 90 um, file opens, file closes kind of things. They're not my functions, but they're library functions I'm using. And then you'll often see the overhead of the profiler itself. So mCount, monControl, monitor, those kind of things. And what, uh, depending on the compiler you're using, what are in, uh, inserted to do that, that kind of profiling. We just, you just note if that m count is is uh, high, so it's going to take up a lot of runtime. Here we were on six percent. That's probably fine. If that was up at 20, 30 percent of my runtime, it would probably suggest that actually one of the performance problems I have is lots of small function calls. Calls being you know the overhead of function calls is 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 then going to be high, and that's somewhere I should look at. So if the actual monitoring program is being called a lot, uh, then it's uh, it's going to be assuming that, that kind of that, that kind of overhead is, is one of the issues I have. So there are some sensible rules for profiling that's worth following. Um, so the first one is to do profiling. So the compiler and the hardware will not 
optimize your code entirely for you. So if you want to get better performance, we need to profile our code and find out where the code actually is spending its time. You probably want to profile on the hardware you want to run it on. So if we want to optimize for Arch 2, we probably want to profile on Arch 2 rather than on your local system because different hardware and different compilers will give different results. If possible, you probably want to profile the code running a full size problem or a representative case compared to what you want to optimize for. Because a lot of applications, their performance changes depending on your input and your test cases because the codes can do different things. So for instance, if I was to take the cast step code, which is a materials modeling code, I know it can do many different kinds of simulations and they'll all have different profiles. So if I want to optimize it, I need to optimize for the kind of simulation I care about. And then the final one is, it, this is generally a iterative cycle. So what we want to do is profile the code, do some optimizations, then reprofile the code, and then see other more optimizations I can do. And you can continue that iterations ad infinitum, but uh, at some point you'll probably have to stop. But each time round, it's worth making a profile, it's worth evaluating the performance optimization and going on from that. Now, Archer 2 being a create system has um, different, uh, has other profiles on it, more involved, more detailed, uh, some uh, designed to do help with parallel profile as well. And the one that, that Cray provide is a one called CrayPat, which can do both the sampling and, and, and tracing functionality. Um, and it has this set of uh, workflow that's uh, recommended to, to, to use it. So the idea is to build um, the code with a profiler, run it and get a, a statistic sort of sampling based profile. And then you can use that to re-instrument the code and get more detailed tracing for the bits you care about. So you can do this sort of two stage process here where you can get a, a sensible profile and then use that to get a more detailed profile for a given um, part of the code, which is important in terms of performance. How do we do this on Archer 2? Uh, well, there's a module we can load, so module load perf tools light. Then all we have to do is rebuild our application. So um, make clean and make if you're using make files, but basically rebuild the application from the start with this module loaded will enable this kind of tracing profiling for you or sampling profiling for you. And then you just run your executable and it will produce a performance file um, for you. So this is examples here of the kind of stuff it tells you um, where it said, I've run this um, and it produces, you know, this is your program. 55% is being spent in MPI and most of that's in an MPI all to all. And then 40% is in what we call user code. And we can see that split across these, say, eight functions here. Uh, and then you can go and have a look actually where were those actually called in the code. So it will give you this kind of GProf style output where you say, where was that called from? Okay, this function reman, where's it? Oh, it's actually in this, this bit of source code here and, and this bit of source code here and, and how often are these things called? Um, et cetera is generally in this scenario, um, things which are uh, system libraries or things that are code but not compiled by and, and, and implemented in your in your application. So anything that you're calling from a system library or, or from an external library that's not been built with profile and will we'll come under this, et cetera. So that could be things like file opens, file closes, um, but it could be uh, some other functions as well. Um, then you can also do this more involved tracing where you use the perf tools. So you, you do you can load a different module here, module load perf tools rather than a light one. And then you use a program called pat build. So pat build, you, you build your application. Normally you do pat build and then you do this minus O APA and the name of your executable. And that will create you a new executable called something plus pat. You then run, run that and that will give you a, 
a more detailed um, application profile. And then when it also produces what we call an APA file, which says these are the places we should trace more in more detail. And then you rebuild your application using this pat build minus O and the name of that APA file. And then that lets you rerun it and you get an even more detailed uh, profile with much more detailed information about that specific parts of the code, which are expensive. And it also comes with some visualizers, so what we call Cray Apprentice 2, which lets you uh, find uh, details uh, and visualize details about your performance. We'll, we'll come on to look at that. It's possible to, ease, to use these tools to find hotspots uh, in your code. So you can have a look at things like L1 and L2 cache misses and hits and the use of vector instructions. Um, and so the Cray Pat will try and automatically find these hotspots in a routine for you, either using the Cray API where you can label regions to um, profile or use some specific functionality built into some of the Cray compilers, which let you profile uh, directly. So if you use the Cray compilers rather than GNU or AMD compilers, you can, you can tell it to turn on some more involved features and generate some profile for you. And then you'll get some loop statistics um, uh, provided in that kind of thing. So these are the kind of more in-depth things you can see from these kind of profilers, where we can see for an individual function here, you can see how much time was spent in this function, how much of the overall program time was that. Uh, and we start to see things like imbalance calls here. So this is actually when we were in the parallel programming, what does the parallel program, what does that look like? like across all the workers and here we see oh actually there's about 15 percent time imbalance between different workers i.e some workers spend 15 percent longer or shorter on this than others and then you can see how many calls how many times is this function called and some of the hardware details in here so there's things in here like the cache bandwidth uh data cache level two to data cache level one bandwidth the cache hit and miss ratio at level two. So it's about 95% cache hits at level two. Um, uh, the number of floating point operations uh, that are undertaken. Um, so you hear it's saying you're getting about 12% of the peak floating point performance uh, and some more in-depth hardware, um, hardware calculations here. So we can see there's lots of scalar operations and not very many uh, vector operations and, and some of those kind of things. So this is a kind of more in-depth stuff you can get, but it requires a bit more, um, a bit more knowledge to uh, interpret and a bit more knowledge to get data out of them. Because so, you know you're then going to have questions like, uh, well, is 95% uh, hit ratio good or bad? Those kind of things. Um, so Creapat lets you interface with those hardware counters. So this, this data here, we've got L1, L2, floating point operations, SIMD vectorization instructions. Creapat is, is getting the hardware counter data from the processor when you're running to give you this kind of data. And so you can do that using the Creapat functionality, which lets you say for per program or for a function, um, what kind of uh, hardware usage you might get in. Now you can't generally collect all the hardware counters uh, when we're running. So the AMD processors um, will only let you, for this kind of hardware, collect two counters at a time. So if you wanted to get all your counter data, so all your hardware data about what's going on, you, you need to run multiple times collecting different counters. Um, there's, a, there's a thing called PAPI, the PAPI, uh, which lets you access these hardware counters. But in, in this scenario, we can use them on Arch2 using these environment variables. So there's this pat rt perf counter uh, parameter, which we can define what we want to collect. Uh, and if you're interested in what hardware counters there are, uh, you can have a look either using some man pages or have a look at this file here. And that tells you the hardware counters that are available on on Archer 2. But in general, you can look at a general summary with TLB activity, a general summary with 
branching activity, then there's memory bandwidth, bandwidth for uh, different levels of cache and um, CPU instruction level information, so stalls on load store and floating point units. It's not, they're not got huge amounts of powder counters, unfortunately, the AMD uh, ROM or EPIC processors, um, but that's what we have to work with. So, you know, again, this is an example here, another function call where we have this kind of being collected L3 cache, L2 cache, um, L1 cache, and um, some of the number of uh, instructions issued and uh, retired kind of um, features here. For career path, the performance numbers are generally averaged over all ranks. Um, so this is for parallel processes. Uh, if you just run a serial process, obviously that doesn't matter. Um, but you can also use the career path functionality to uh, the reporting functionality to pull out data from particular places. So you can actually just say, I only want the data from an one processor or from the first 1,000 processors or something like that. Now, again, this only makes sense if you're running parallel applications, but that's what most people are spending their time for uh, doing on um, on a system like Archer 2. It's also possible to get more um, information for some programming models. So for OpenMP, for instance, uh, CreaPad has this functionality to look at, um, particularly for Cray compilers, the OpenMP uh, profiling. Uh, and then you can have a look at per thread uh, data as well. So if you're using OpenMP programs, it's worth having a look at that. Um, and then uh, you can then use the PAT report or that kind of functionality to give you data on that. We'll have a look at what the graphical interface looks like for that as well. Um, and also CreaPAT will give you some kind of information on memory usage as well. So how well is my memory being consumed? How where is my memory being consumed? And that can be on another uh, interesting or, or important um, metric for for profiling. So is my application spending too much time allocating and freeing and where is my memory being sent? Um, um, those kind of things. So this is an example of a memory table here. Uh, we've got high memory uh, being allocated, total number of allocates, total number of frees, and memories not uh, freed or allocated. So a sort of memory leaks you can also identify here. So it sort of depends exactly what you're kind of looking for for profile and what you kind of get out of these things. Um, the, generally, we're not looking for memory leaks with, with CreaPack, but it can it can pick up some of those issues. But it can be these sort of total allocates, total freeze, those kind of things that can be useful here for that kind of information. If, if memory allocations are going to be one of the challenges for your application. Um, so the career path thing also comes along with a, a viewing data. Um, OK, so uh, the question here, why is that regarding the memory leaks? Um, career path is a profiler. Um, so we don't, we're not generally using it for debugging. So generally, when you've got to a point where you're doing the the profile and you hopefully have an application you're reasonably happy with and it, it works uh, reasonably, you're happy it's working well. And that will generally mean that you, you're not in a point where you're leaking memory, you've sort of fixed those kind of problems before. It's not to say that you won't have uh, memory leaks, but it's just generally rarer when you get to that, that point where we're doing this kind of thing. Um, one of the challenges with parallel programs is it, it can be hard to identify if there are memory leaks for a lot of applications because the way things like the communication libraries work, the MPI library and stuff, um, it, um, it it can look to a lot of profiles like it's leaking memory when it really isn't. Um, and so I wouldn't I wouldn't focus too much on the memory leak stuff in, in the career patch stuff or because it can be hard to identify what are memory leaks and what aren't memory leaks. But uh, the functionality is, I, I must admit, I've not used it in, in, in anger, uh, particularly in the career patch stuff. Um, we tend to use Valgrind more if you, if you are looking for memory leaks directly. But uh, as I say, that can be difficult with things like MPI to identify. 
Um, Cray also provide this apprentice two tool for looking at your data, so it will uh, it will visualize some of the uh, performance data that comes out of Craypad. Uh, and so this is the ex an example of the kind of thing you get here. You know, it will give you graphs of of the imbalance and uh, and these kind of things and, and the data movement and memory utilization. You can actually install a desktop version of this. So for uh, on the system, uh, a bunch of things you can take and install it locally. So you can copy the profile and data back to your system and and, and load that up as well there. Um, so profiling is is essential tool for performance optimization. Uh, even just in understanding the performance you have at uh, the bottleneck, even just for a single core program, it's very useful. There are some default profilers that are available and around and about uh, that we can use for our applications, and that's great. Uh, but there are also more in depth and involved profilers, like the Craypat one, which give us maybe more uh, evaluation of individual bits of code or bits of functionality like an OpenMP and those kind of things memory usage, um, parallel information, uh, visualizers, and those kind of things. And Craypat's not the only one. We have other profiles, uh, profiles available. There's one called Scalaska. Uh, there's one called uh, Map, which can also be used to show you different things about your program. But fundamentally, profile your code, find out what's going on, and then we can start to, to look at, um, to optimize it. Uh, and then we can take it from there. Uh, has anybody got any questions about profiling? Uh, so does GProf have any deep support for use with uh, with OpenMP? Um, I mean, Cray, um, Cray uh, sorry, GProf will profile OpenMP codes, but won't necessarily tell you sensible things about what's going on inside them um, because of uh, the way it works with uh, sampling different process counters. Um, I mean, it will still give you a bulk overall, this is what's going on in the code, but it may be that some of it is not accurate to the thread level. Uh, Craypat will give you quite a good, um, or should give you quite a good overview of the thread level. Uh, work in uh, so you sort of generally need a, a parallel profiler if you're going to go into the OpenMP and, and that kind of level of stuff. Although Mark is our OpenMP expert, um, so yeah, he may have. There you go. So so it works, but it gives you aggregate function across all threads, uh, aggregate time across all threads. So um, Craypat will give you some stuff, and, and some of the other profilers will also give you some more per thread stuff as well. Any other questions about profiling? OK, so that leaves us a, a nice chunk of time now to catch back up on the uh, on the practicals. Um, so the idea here now is let me just see if I can get the website up um, and take it from there. Share their website. So I'm going to stop sharing my thing and share a different thing. Okay, so let me just check that. Yeah, okay, so this is the course materials. Um, and if we go here to exercises, there is a uh, practical notes here. Um, and we can go through this download uh, exercise. Uh, and what we're looking to do here is the first two exercises. Exercise one is placement, which is really just run a code on a different um, so this is a streams benchmark. So streams is a is just a memory bandwidth benchmark, um, and then run it um, 
in a single NUMA region and then across NUMA regions. And so if we can see that performance difference we were talking about for um, accessing memory across uh, different parts of the hardware inside a single node. Um, and you can then play around with uh, different process counts um, to, to specify how many workers you want to run and see what you see the bandwidth there. It, it actually, when you run this, you make it, you run it, it runs a program called XTHI first, uh, which can be quite useful in terms of it specifying uh, the XTH5 program is just something that prints out what worker is running where. So you can sort of see how your workload is distributed across the processor. And then we run the streams benchmark in the same way and we take it from there. Uh, and then there's a separate exercise, CREPAT. Uh, if we go and have a look at this here, CREPAT intro, which we can then work through to do get some experience uh, doing the CREPAT uh, profiling and, and looking at what a profile looks like in CREPAT. So the idea is go through, get on the system, try exercise one with a placement, um, and then uh, move on to exercise two. And if you have any questions or any problems in the meantime, just get in touch, let us know what's going on and how you're getting on. Um, and we'll do this up till one o'clock when we'll have a break, one till two for lunch. And then after that, we come back uh, two or three on a, another lecture on optimizing the compiler. Any questions? So really do, if you have any issues getting anything up and running, things that are not working or things that don't make sense in the exercises, please do let me know. Uh, it's likely some of the stuff is not well explained. So just, just get in touch and, and fire away. Um, other than that, uh, when you have any questions, you can through them, just get in touch as well. And I'll be around uh, until one. Thank you.